if the Ten Commandments are posted in the classroom, and if they are read and taken seriously as the way to God and the way to please God as those in the Christian camp want that to happen. If this happens, I predict this. No, I guarantee this, that rather than curtailing murder, murders will increase. Where there was no thought of murder before, murder will enter the mind. Look for an outbreak of stealing in our public classrooms should the Ten Commandments actually be placed where students can read and heed God's laws. Where there was no covenant, there will be covenant. And those who never thought of taking God's name in vain will do so. Or they will have the sudden urge to do so. You know, I don't I think that maybe the the liberals are not so disdainful of God as they are of the idea that God's ways should be administered by self-righteous, zealous without knowledge, Christians. Fundamental Christians. I think that's their nightmare, and well, it should be. You're listening to AM 1000 WCCD Radio, programming for the soul of the city. It's time now for Summer Nights, right here on WCCD. For the next two hours, we will take you inside of the heart of ministries and churches that are making an impact on the city of Cleveland. And now, with this week's featured ministry, here is the host of Summer Nights, right here on AM 1000, Ricardo Johnson. Thank you, Eric, and welcome to this Monday, July the 12th, 1999, of Summer Nights on WCCD, the soul of the city. Glad to have you listening in. Hey, they are back. Yes, they are back. Grace Cafe, they are back. The gang's all sitting in there, ready to go. So, let's go to... None of this translation. Ladies and gentlemen, you know them, you love them, you can't live without them. Or maybe you could, the one and only. Martin Zender. I am happy to be here, too. I am also happy to be back. And quite surprised to be back. There he goes with a pop again. Uh, Kurt's got the, you got the Pepsi One. With a star, weird Star Wars people on the can. Charlie's drinking Diet Pepper, Diet Dr. Pepper. I'm, I'm drinking I'm water. Brisk. I'm brisk. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm drinking water. So I, I have the clear brain here. Um, you know, <laughs> Kurt said we're going to talk about grace, and we are in a backhanded way. Uh, we're going to talk about the law. And this week we're going to talk about law and sin and the law, the purpose of, of the law and uh you think, well, what does that have to do with grace? Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding concerning the law and the Ten Commandments specifically. A lot of misunderstanding uh, concerning those that is really sabotaging people's appreciation of grace. You know, there is, um, in Second Timothy, Paul exhorts Timothy to expose, rebuke, and entreat. Well, we can entreat about grace and and treat and give the positiveness of grace over and over again, but uh, unless we get rid of some of the obstacles and expose and rebuke as we're entreating, then uh, you won't understand what grace really is. I kind of think of the example of paving a road. Uh, you have to get rid of the obstacles in the road before you can pave the road. So we're, we're going to pave the road of grace here, and there's a few obstacles, namely uh, misunderstanding concerning the Ten Commandments. Um, you know, on the heels of the Columbine shooting, Congress has passed a measure to allow the Ten Commandments in the classroom. This is a very heated issue now uh, in your op-ed pages of the newspaper. I agree that the Ten Commandments ought to be allowed to be posted. But I think that those who are promoting this measure, and a lot of Christian camps are backing this, obviously, they would also desire not only to have the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments posted, but I believe, wouldn't you agree, guys, that it's their desire that people read and heed the commandments as if this would be the answer. I think that people think that by giving people an opportunity to read and heed what God commanded and did not command Israelites to do, 
will somehow dissuade students from crime. But this is not the case. In fact, I believe what we are looking at here is a disaster in the making. Astonishingly, the Christian camps that really ought to be working against this measure, I'm going to tell you why in a moment, but they're, they're cheering it because, again, they hope that students will be reading and heeding God's laws. Did I say they should be fighting it? I did. Because if the pastors and Christian teachers in this land had a clue as to why the Ten Commandments came in the first place, they would be siding with the liberals, who, as we know, are aggressively, you guys are looking at me surprised, who are, the liberals are aggressively pushing for the separation of church and state. They're practically begging lawmakers, the liberals are, that the Ten Commandments not be placed in public buildings. Again, let me say, I'm all for freedom of expression. They should be allowed to be placed. But in a very real sense, I hope the liberals win. They are right, the liberals are right, but for wrong reasons. They just don't want God's name to be mentioned in public. The religious right want people to read and heed God's laws. But again, I say they are not understanding why the Ten Commandments came in the first place. <sighs> if the Ten Commandments are posted in the classroom, and if they are read and taken seriously as the way to God and the way to please God as those in the Christian camps want that to happen. If this happens, I predict this. No, I guarantee this, that rather than curtailing murder, murders will increase. Where there was no thought of murder before, murder will enter the mind. Look for an outbreak of stealing in our public classrooms should the Ten Commandments actually be placed where students can read and heed God's laws. Where there was no covening, there will be covening. And those who never thought of taking God's name in vain will do so. Or they will have the sudden urge to do so. You know, I, don't, I think that maybe the, the liberals are not so disdainful of God as they are of the idea that God's ways should be administered by self-righteous, zealous without knowledge, Christians. Fundamental Christians. I think that's their nightmare, and well, it should be. Folks, why did the law of God come? You're about to find out. Stay tuned. Many of you might know. Many don't. I think the answer is going to shock a lot of people. Well, I think one of the reasons that the Ten Commandments came was to set up a backdrop for grace and for mercy. All right, I, everybody's looking at me. Okay, go ahead, uh, Mike. Uh, let me just, just... Yeah. I will not fear because I know who rules this world. I'm walking through. And I don't understand mercy, but... It's important. That's why you're listening to Grace Cafe tonight. I know that because we're going to explain using the Word of God about grace and mercy. We're even going to take you beyond mercy. Yeah. Mercy is not ideal. It's not the best thing God has. Justification blows mercy out of the water. Mm. Yeah. Mercy says, this is going to give you a preview of what we're going to do Friday. Mercy says... Well, you did wrong. You really screwed up. I'm going to look the other way and be nice to you. Justification is you didn't even do wrong. That is radical. Justification, the root word there is just. It means right. What you did was right. Do we have to wait till Friday? Yeah, yeah, we have to wait till Friday. 
So, but we might touch on it because it does. It will come into this. Uh, when, whenever you have law, uh, you get into the forgiveness and mercy. You have mercy on somebody who breaks law. But uh, when you have a message of justification apart from law, then you can, then you see God doing a whole new thing apart from the realm of law. And here's another surprising thing with the Ten Commandments, just as a way of introduction, but it's something that you need to keep in mind here. That Ten Commandments came only to one nation, Israel. It did not come to any other nation. People forget that. Uh, we hear about the nations who had not law, but by you know through their conscience they did the things of the law, but they didn't do it through law. We're going to talk about, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the Ten Commandments tonight. And we really do challenge you to call in. Tell us why you think law came. I'd be interested to hear some pastors and some teachers telling us why they believe law came. In the meantime, I'm going to look at, at the Scriptures and uh, see what they say. And really, I think once I put the Scriptures out, it'd be a rare, it'd be a bold person to call and contradict the Scriptures. And you know, two weeks ago, we sat in front of these microphones teaching about the salvation of all mankind. And we refuted from the Scriptures eternal torment. We refuted it using facts in the Word of God. We went into the Greek, and we went one fact after another, and we refuted it. No pastor or teacher, official, and we had a couple people call that disagreed with us. Maybe one of them was a teacher. But where were the dozens of others? I take silence to be a tacit admission that what we are teaching is right. Two weeks ago. So... Let's keep that here. Let's keep that going. If you think we're wrong, call in. Tell us why. Call in here. We want to hear from you, especially pastors and teachers. After 8 o'clock. After 8 o'clock. And also, you'll need to know the number. It's one 281 Write it down now because you're probably going to need it. It's toll free, by the way. one 281 You know, the, the Ten Commandments, amazingly, are still put forth in many churches as the way to please God part of your salvation. Now, I realize that other churches have a more sophisticated error um, in that, okay, we're not saved by the law, but it's a good thing to keep around because we're still expected to do the law. Well, it's this very error that hung the Galatians. You remember? I love what Paul said. Paul dealt with this. He was dealing with people of the nations who never had law. They never heard of Moses. And yet Paul declared them to be complete in Christ. Now, how can somebody be complete in Christ having never heard the law of Moses? And I'll say this, that that law hindered many in Israel from hearing the message of grace Paul brought to the nations. That's why I say that in many camps, in Christian camps, law is a roadblock to a proper understanding of grace. Anyway, in, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, O oh, foolish Galatians. Now, this is a foolhardy thing. I, I love this in uh, the Phillips uh, paraphrase. J.B. Phillips has a paraphrase of the Scriptures, and this is the way he starts this. Dear idiots of Galatia. <laughs> I'm serious, Phillips. Dear idiots of Galatia, who bewitches you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was graphically crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you get the Spirit by works of law or by the hearing of faith? So idiotic are you? I'm using Philip's word there. Undertaking in spirit, are you now being completed in flesh? You notice Paul is tying in works of law with flesh. Yeah, he's tying in works of law with, with flesh. Because they were being brought back under law by what Paul called dogs. He called the circumcisionist dogs. As soon as Paul left the room... Bang! The circumcisionists came in and said, Paul told you guys, what all? Oh, that, that's nice, but just keep these laws around uh, just to help you in your walk. Yeah, these laws won't save you, but you know, you really they'll really help you along. Keep them on your walls. Keep them tacked to your refrigerators. You need these. You can't throw Moses away. That's what they told him. Paul just about flipped. 
Whew, he didn't like that. He came right back and says, oh, you're idiots. So it seems like there's a big division between grace and law. Yes. That's very astute of you. Thank you. Thank you. I study with the best. We'll be back after the break with more of Grace Cafe. Sounds like things are just getting heated up here at Grace Cafe. We will be back right after the break in about three minutes, so stay right with us. Hey, we're back on Summer Nights on WCCD, the soul of the city. Glad to have you listening in. The number of the call at about 8 o'clock, a little bit after 8, is one 281 1110 that's one 281 1110 If you have any questions for a Grace Cafe. Now, let's go to... Is that Ken? Let's go back to somebody there, okay? Kurt. <laughs> Mr. Somebody. He, Car right. Ricardo, you can go back to anybody you want to. I didn't know you guys were pointing at that. That's all right. Well, that's all right. We're, you guys call me anything you want. Just don't call me late to dinner. Oh, yeah. We won't So that's that. who you're pointing right. at, okay? <laughs> You were talking. I heard the tires screeching. Cars went off the road. Accidents. Now I hear the sirens. What in the world are you talking uh, about? You... That murders are going to increase. Coveting is going to increase. People, uh, children are going to be turned into larcenists because of the law. <laughs> Tell I me, say please. Arsonist. Tell I didn't say arsonists. Larcenists. Oh, larcenists. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's true. Right. I, I can't get into that right now. I mean, we Probably. are going to get into it in a matter of minutes. Maybe okay. a couple dozen minutes. I'm, I'm laying the I ground. want to hear the siren stop. Okay, well, we caused a few accidents out on Route 77, maybe. Uh, that's shocking news to hear that, yeah, to hear that if these commandments are posted and if they are, you know, it's one thing just posting them. You put them in the cellar or in the boiler room or something. That, that, that's fine. But I fear that they will be, you know, posted where people will get the idea that this is expected of them by God. That, that's the thing. My sister just brought in an article. My sister came in. Hi, Kelly. She lives in Canton. She drives up to see this show. She just brought me this, the newspaper article. Where, where's this from? This is uh, the, the Canton Repository from Saturday, July the 10th. And uh, look, th this is just what I'm talking about. The, 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 the writer of this article, uh, Mike McManus, he's a religion ethics columnist. He says many will agree. Uh, he's, he's quoting this uh, Catholic... Bishop Timlin says, I am in favor of anything that will help to correct the moral compass of our young people. Putting the Ten Commandments in a prominent place in our schools and teaching them is a step in the right direction. What harm can come from this? None as far as I can see. Well, first, see, this, this confirmed my suspicion. That look, they're hoping that this will correct the moral compass. It's not just a thing where a freedom of speech thing, see? It's not a freedom of speech issue. Well, it is in a way, and on that grounds, I agree that people should be allowed to put the Ten Commandments on the wall. But see, their secret agenda is not just to have it on the wall, but they want to infiltrate the students with this thought that God, that you can do these commandments, that God commands this, and you do them or else. And this guy says, this, this bishop, uh, Bishop Timlin says, what harm can come from this? Well, I'm about to show you what harm could come from it in the Scriptures. Keep that in mind. That, that's a good article. Thanks for bringing that, Kelly. Um, the Ten Commandments. We, we just said that, yeah, Paul said that um, Paul, again, his message of grace was constantly undermined by those who kept trying to bring the Ten Commandments into the picture. And I see the same thing happening today. It's happening in Congress. It's happening with, with Bishop Timlin. It's hap happening with people who don't understand why the law came. Folks, and we're not playing games here with the Ten Commandments. Let me tell you that. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 19, verse 11. If you don't want to turn there, I'll read it for you. This is God to Moses. This is the Ten Commandments. This is the background of the coming of the law. And come to be prepared for the third day. For on the third day, Yahweh shall descend on Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. 
And you will set a boundary for the people around about, saying, Guard yourselves concerning ascent into the mountain, or touching its outermost part. Everyone touching the mountain shall be put to death, yea, death. This is the background of the Ten Commandments, that we have gilded in gold, and mounted on walnut plaques, and embroidered onto colorful pieces of cloth. If you touch the mountain, the very mountain where this law came down, you would die. That's pretty serious. I mean, the mountain. Guard yourselves concerning ascent under the mountain or touching its outermost part. Everyone touching the mountain shall be put to death. Yea, death. It's like death. Get it? Death. <laughs> That's what he's saying there. That's the yea. Um, no hand shall touch him, for he shall be stoned. Yea, stoned, or shot, yea, shot. But yeah, how can they shoot him? Well, they shot him with arrows, okay? Whether beast or man, he shall not live. That's a pretty setting, isn't it? That's pretty scary. Pretty scary. I'd mean, be scared to death. You mean little Mary walking close to the mountain next to the, the bottom of the, the where they're not allowed to uh, yeah. go would be... Don't yeah, if you're picking shot. blackberries, if you're out picking blackberries for to put in the pie for lunch, if you accidentally wander past that boundary, bang, you were you were killed. No questions asked. You had an arrow shot through your heart, or you were you were stoned. If an animal, even a beast, see, so that someone once told me, well, it's a willful sin. If if you willfully do it, then you'll be killed. No, how can an uh, a beast we're talking about. What are you going to do? Take your donkey aside? Now you listen here, donkey. You don't go past that boundary. You understand me? No, it's not. It's whether you touch it. It's not, nothing to do with willful or not. You just did not touch it. You remember what happened to that guy who tried to steady the ark? What was that guy's name? David Buddy. David's Buddy. That was his name. <laughs> David was bringing the ark back. He was bringing the ark back, and uh, the ark started to fall, and somebody reached out to touch it. Well, you did not touch the ark if you were not a Levite. This guy touched it, trying to do a good thing. Bang! He was instantly killed. This was a serious death-dealing affair. Right from its inception, we see death. And the, the New Testament is going to confirm that for us. Go to Exodus now. Go, go to verse 16. It came to be on the third day at the coming of the morning that there came to be sounds and flashes and a heavy cloud on the mount and the sound of a trumpet exceedingly steadfast. Hence, all the people who were in the camp rejoiced and said, Praise the Lord. No, they trembled. That's what my version said. They trembled. They were scared to death. And we should have equal fear being scared to death today. But no, let's put the Ten Commandments on the wall. It'll be nice. No, they're, they're missing the whole thing. Go, go to Exodus 20, verse 21. Exodus 20, verse 21. Then the people stood afar. See, the law distances people from God. Did you know that? Did you know that the instructions given in the law about uh, not just the Ten Commandments, but how to build the sanctuary, the sanctuary, how to build the tabernacle, there was curtain after curtain after curtain after curtain after curtain. The law separates men from God. It doesn't bring them near. It shows the distance. It's distance. That's why it says here in Exodus 20, 21, the people stood afar. And look at 19. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Good. That is a good one. Why didn't I read that? Right there in 19. Yeah, Exodus 20, 19. Wow. And they, they knew they would die. They weren't even allowed to touch the mountain where these laws were coming down. That's the first clue. And the people stood afar, which definitely confirms that. Yet Moses, he came close to the murkiness where the one, Elohim, was. I'm reading from a literal uh, version here where Elohim, uh, your version might read, read God. But the word I want to emphasize here is murkiness. This is the aura surrounding Mount Sinai. It's from a Hebrew word, arafal. It's intensely dark or gloomy, obscure, gloominess. 
darkness, murkiness. I'm setting the stage. I'm setting the stage surrounding the coming of this law that now we want to put in shimmering gold and walnut on the walls of our classroom. And I would say that uh, what they also want to do is just as the people of Israel did back in uh, 19, uh, let's see, what was it, uh, verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Right. That's the same mindset the people have today. And that's exactly what God wanted them to say. Because he was setting them up. We're going to get to that in a moment. God was setting them up. Right. And they did not know what they were being set up for. Keep that right. verse in mind. That's a good one. But folks, this is the backdrop. The verses I read for you out of Exodus 19 and 20 is a backdrop. This is not children's Bible hour. This is not Uncle Charlie singing about doing God's law. Why would you say Charlie? Uncle Charlie, not you. You're not even an uncle yet. You can't yes, be uncle. I am. You are? Yeah. Oh, okay, we, we'll get into that at, during the break. But this is not a game. There's no organ music on Mount Sinai. There are... It's thunder, lightning, there's darkness, murkiness, obscurity, God being hidden far away, the people at a distance from God, the threat of death. Yeah, if there is organ music, it's the death march. That's right. That's right, Charlie. This law is what was later described by Paul as a dispensation of condemnation, 2 Corinthians 3.9. It was called a dispensation of death, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. It was the failure of human flesh to accomplish this law that sent God's Son naked to the stake to be crucified. God did not write this law on the sky or engraven in gold. He wrote it on rock. The same rock that smashed your skull in if you touched that mountain. The same rock that cleaved your skull if you picked up sticks on the Sabbath day. And that's a commandment. Keep the Sabbath holy. What do you think that meant? Going to church? No. That meant you did not pick up a stick on the Sabbath or they cleaved your skull with a rock. And it happened. Just to, just to go along with what you just said, that it, that it was the law that caused Christ to have to come. Uh, Galatians 3, 10, 11 says the works of law are under a curse. Those, those who are under law, those right, who are right. of works of law are under a curse. We're talking right. about human beings. Right, but That's right. Christ reclaims us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for our sakes. Right, he, yeah. So Christ had right. to become a curse for our sake That's right. to undo the curse of the law. And it was a curse. Was you're, a curse what, yeah. Read that, that, verse, that verse again. That those, okay, you're in Galatians 3.10? Yeah, yeah. 3.10 through 13. Whoever are of works of law are under a curse. Now, who out there wants to be under a curse? Raise your hand. Call me at one triple eight. 281-1110, and tell me if you want to be under a curse. Call me. If you want the Ten Commandments posted in your church as if we are to do these, then you are, want to be under a curse. And I, I want to hear why you would want to be under a curse. I, I, I really do. I don't think they believe those verses. Those are the kind of verses that you read from Paul that, are, that seem to be over your head. When you're first reading the reading Paul, right? You know, I mean, you don't grab hold of them right away, and because you don't grab hold of them, you just move on. Yeah, and, and there's one thing that people tend to do nowadays. They uh, they're putting up the Ten Commandments. Well, I'm sorry, but if you read, uh, go on ahead and read there yeah. in ten. Right. Accursed is everyone who is uh, not remaining in all things written in the scroll of the law. That's a pretty big to do problem. them. Yeah. There is not just ten commandments. That's Galatians uh, 3.10. Okay. It was just the second half of it. Okay. 
You can't pick and choose what you want, folks. But people are always trying to do that. They say, well, we separate the ceremonial law from the moral law. There is no scripture that gives you the right to do that. That's right. Paul says it right here. This is New Testament teaching. New Testament teaching. Paul says, cursed, or it says, uh, Accursed is everyone who is not remaining in all things written in the scroll of the law to do them. We might as well read verse verse 11, uh, Kurt and Chuck, while we're at it. Okay. Uh, now that in law not one is being justified, for the just one by faith shall be living. And the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. If you're going to put the Ten Commandments on the wall, you might as well put a plaque under it that says this has nothing to do with faith. Nothing to do with faith. And yet we're a people of faith, I thought. And yet, I read here, the law is not of faith. Verse 12, as plain as can be, the law is not of faith. But he who does them, and is not this what people want them to do? They want them to do them. It says that uh, he who does them shall be living in them. And that means also bringing, and that means, right. living in what they bring. Living in what they bring, which is death and condemnation. And you curse. cannot slip up in the law. And yet, very true, uh, very true, Charlie, Christ reclaims us. Or, Kurt, as you say, Christ reclaims us from the curse of the law. Yeah, living in the law, as uh, Romans 7.11 says, for sin getting the incentive through the precept deludes me and through it kills me. There's, a, there, there, there's three witnesses. We have death in uh, Don't go so fast. In Exodus. Go back to that again. We have death in Exodus. You'd be killed if you touched the mountain in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 7. I guess we didn't go there. We should go there. I just mentioned that verse. But let's see it in black and white. I think people do need to see it, you Yeah, guys. okay, you're they right. They can't hear it and take our word for it. They need to see it with their own eyes. Second, Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians uh, 3, 6. God, 2 Corinthians, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. God who also makes us competent dispensers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter is killing. The letter he's speaking of there is the letter chiseled in stone. You're going to see that in a second. The letter is killing, yet the Spirit is vivifying. Now, if the dispensation of death by letters chiseled in stone, see, disposition of death, and he, he goes on there to talk about it, it's a fading glory. But uh, I, I want to go down to verse 9. He says, For if in the dispensation of condemnation, okay, he calls it a dispensation of condemnation in verse 9, and he calls it a dispensation of death in verse 7 of Second Corinthians chapter 3. And he says it's killing. It's killing in 6. That's why I fear. I fear of the misguided zeal of Christian zealots. Yeah, you got you got the Ten Commandments out there, and uh, you'll notice that in a lot of these uh, places that uh, it seems like man just cannot obey law. You know, it just can't seem to obey law. And in fact, you know, you find yourself driving down the road, and what is one of the first laws that you break? Of course, it's a man's law, but everybody seems to be breaking the law while they're going to church or while they're going to work. Speak for yourself. Now, I've never broken the speed limit. <laughs> and you know what, though? You know, men are more apt to obey man's laws. This is another thing. I don't know if you, you finished your point there. I think we're, the cops are going to be watching you on the way home yeah. now. <laughs> you know that. What kind of car do you drive? <laughs> well, if they saw Who can it? tell? It's going too fast. <laughs> I can see that beard flying past in the yeah, back of it. Beard hanging out the window. I had a white knuckle ride with him home yesterday. But, but, you, but you, you think about that, though. Uh, there are those who are really adhering to uh, righteousness through the law in the churches today, and yet they cannot even keep the speed limit, which is the simplest law that I, I think see, you yeah. can come up with. Right, right. You know, and they can't even keep that. Come into church yeah. where they hold up the Ten <laughs> Commandments. Good point. Yeah, really, good point. Yeah, One, that is a good point. There is another point. I imagine people are kind of questioning to themselves, what in the world are these people doing cutting down the Ten Commandments 
and the law and the things that we've always been taught that we should be doing. And you kind of hit on it, but you didn't go far enough. And I just want you to know that there is something else out there. There's a reason we're doing this, folks. And that's back in Second Corinthians uh, three nine. For if the if the dispensation of condemnation is glory, okay, there appears to be some glory in it. Much rather, the dispensation of righteousness is exceeding in glory. What we are doing, folks, is laying the foundation to show you so that we can bring to you and show you that there is something that exceeds in glory. Right. Thanks for bringing that in, Charlie. A very good point. We have the advantage of being able to see the big picture. We see law compared to grace. Those Israelites, that's all they knew, and it came with glory. There was a certain glory attached to the coming of the law. But again, it was a glory that you dare not cross it or you would die. And yet there was a glory. And yet it was a fading glory. We know Moses put the veil over his face. Uh, Not that people wouldn't see the glory, but so they wouldn't see the glory departing from his face. And it is a departing glory. And we have the advantage of being able to see that compared with grace, Law is a very receding and declining glory. And the problem, of course, we have with it is that it's being treated today as the way to go, the things to obey. Ken, going back to your speed limit example, um, in Romans 8, uh, verse 7, we find that the disposition of the flesh, and we're all in flesh here, is enmity to God for it is not subject to the law of God, and neither is it able. See, it's not subject, and it's not able to be subject to the law of God. Can I read this in another version? Go on, too. Finish the verse. Yeah, oh, where? Where? Verse 7? Should uh, I finish it? Oh, yeah. Verse 8. Yeah, okay. Those who are in flesh are not able to please God. Yeah, that's a good one. Go ahead, Denise. What oh, are you no, reading just, out of? I'm just saying that sometimes it, you've got to see it in another version, you know, different okay. ways of putting it. What version it. are you reading out of? Uh, NASB. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Verse 8. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Yeah, that's... I know, says the same thing. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but I know you're just backing it up. No, I and mean, you're an artist. I understand that. No, you're no, temperamental. No. Sometimes when you read big words and things like that, every, the big, average, big word. Hey, everybody out there, listen to us. It's not a, you know, like a. Oh, you mean the word scholar. disposition? Yeah. Things oh well, like that's that. a sound word there. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're a, no. I'm glad you brought that up, Denise. Don't feel bad. Those of you out there who think they're talking over your head, please call in and just <laughs> tell them that you appreciate my input. <laughs> Don't we, call. We do appreciate your input. We do. We do. And you have a nice purple dress tonight. You look. You look very nice. See now, I'm flattering her to help. Yeah. <laughs> your hair is Keep just. Going. Your hair. I mean, it's every hair's in place. This is an extremely good hair day for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all this talk about the law, and it seems to just do all all bad stuff. So what is what was the point for coming in the first place? Boy, I, we got the whole week, and wow. you want us to spill all the beans in one night? I can't believe it. The, the law has a purpose, right? But it's, the, it's not the purpose people think. Oh. And I'm just teasing them along here. I'm teasing them along. So I wanted to comment on. We'll be going to, to the break in about uh, four minutes here, but uh, Charlie mentioned, or was it Ken? I, uh, I don't know. One of you guys mentioned that God was setting something up, and he was indeed. He was because, oh, yeah, it was you, Charlie. Israel said all that God said we will do. Yeah, and about a half hour later, yeah. you know, they were dancing around a golden calf. That's all it took. A half hour after Moses is gone, you know, they're, they're in sin already. And, you know, there's a modern, where, where's my article? What, one of the New York Times writers had made a comment about that that I thought was really appropriate. I think it was liberal writer, too. Where, where is this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here it is. Um, this was in the New York Times. 
it was it's by uh, Maureen Dowd, and I'm pretty sure she's a liberal, but uh, she she recognizes something here. At the end of her article, she says this. Um, is, is this where I want to go? Wait a minute. Well, yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. Faith is an intensely personal matter. It it should not be treated as a credential or reduced to a a soundbite. History teaches that when religion is injected into politics, the Crusades, Henry VIII. Uh, Hitler, Kosovo disaster follows. This is man's religion, I think, that she's talking about. This is man's religion. When man puts his religion forth, disaster follows. See? And I, I, I think she's right there. But there's this, this other part that's really, really good here. Where is it? I will find it during the break. i got to read that to you. I, I have to read that to you because she said something about the law making people worse. Um. <clears throat> God set up the Israelites. He sure did. He brought forth this law to prove to the universe once and for all the weakness of mortal flesh. We just read out of Romans 8 that flesh is not able to please God. People didn't always realize that. See, man didn't always know that. Man thought in himself that he'd just give us the instructions and we'll be able to please God. God said, okay, Here's the instructions. And God was using this law to prove to the universe and to man the weakness of mortal flesh. Of course, Israel didn't know that. They, they thought they were going to stun the world by obeying this law. Ken, you got a thought on that? Well, you know, just a lot of people out there, uh, you know, they, they talk about doing the law or uh, keeping the law and... Uh, Yet, at the same time, uh, they find themselves breaking it, and they can't understand that. And I was just having a, just a quick passing thought of free will there, and I thought, you know, if, if men had such free will, how, could, how come they couldn't keep the law? <laughs> yeah. I just couldn't figure that one out there. But, uh, yeah, because they're, they're flesh. God made them just, flesh. Here's that quote from Maureen. It's a good point. Here's that quote from uh, Maureen Dowd. She says, These tablets are a noble guide for living. But since Moses carried them down from Mount Sinai way back in B.C., they have never been known to prevent violence. Indeed, the first sight of, of the commandments at that pagan party with the golden calf actually incited a riot. Interesting commentary. She's a really ahead of a lot of theologians in her understanding of why the law came. One minute. Denise is holding up our one minute sign. You're not supposed to. Do I know. I'm not supposed to acknowledge it. We're supposed to be slick here, and we're not supposed to know that we have signs we're passing on. So, what was the purpose of the law? Purpose of the law was well. I still I want to do that after eight. After eight, it's, people have had too much between seven and eight. We've really. If I say that now, then I will have expected folks to swallow all that in an hour. I I, I can't do that. I have to do that after eight o'clock tell why the law came but before i do that at the top of the hour uh, I'm, i want to compare the israelites to fred flintstone oh that sounds uh, yes i have to do sound. it is i'm going to compare the israelites to fred flintstone and you're going to get a beam of light going to shine and you're going to understand that's in that you. extra revelation you have called second hesitation yeah <laughs> like i say you're an artist <laughs> Please hang on and hold the line. We'll be back after the break with more of Grace Cafe. In Romans, Paul is shutting up all humanity. In chapters 1 and 2, he shuts up the world. In chapters 3 and 4, he shuts up the Jews. And then... In chapter three, chapter three, he shuts up the Jews, and then he's able to. Now that everybody is lying inert, Paul can now tell you what Christ has done, and he does that in Romans three twenty one. Yet now, apart from law, a righteousness of God is manifest. Yet a righteousness of God through Jesus Christ's faith for all and on all who are. Believing. You know what people used to tell me with this verse, the letter is killing, yet the spirit is vivifying, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. They told me that, that the letter was the scriptures. Anytime I would spend a lot of time studying and I would dissect 
my scriptures. I would make notes. They say, they say, Martin, you're just too cerebral. You're too analytical. You're the, the letter is killing, Martin. The letter is killing. And they would say that about the scriptures. The letter is killing, yet the spirit is giving life. This is one of the favorite pet phrases of the Pentecostal church. The letter kills, the letter kills. And they get it from 2 Corinthians 3, 6. But what is Paul talking about? He's talking about, you are our letter engraven in our hearts. Engraven not with ink, but with the spirit. Not on stone tablets. This is the letter not on stone tablets. So the letter of the context is that which was engraved on stone tablets. That's what's killing. The Ten Commandments are killing. Not the scriptures. These, these words I'm reading you from the Apostle Paul give us life. The, the farthest thing you can get from killing. The letter is to love Moses, not the scriptures. Sorry, Pentecostals. Not really. I'm not sorry about it. This needs to be said. Spirit is vivifying. Now, verse 7. Now, if the dispensation of death. Now, this is a definition of the Ten Commandments. And why anybody would read this and continue to tack up the Ten Commandments on the wall or demand that they be posted in government buildings, schools, churches, is beyond me. The dispensation of death, Paul calls it in verse 7. And in verse 9, he calls it a dispensation of condemnation. Dispensation of death? Dispensation of condemnation. Ooh, where can I sign up? That sounds good to me. It, it sounds good to them. Paul says that the dispensation, dispensation of death by letters chiseled in stone, there again, sets the context of what the letter is, letters chiseled in stone. If that came in glory, and it did, it came in a certain glory. There was a glory associated with God bringing the law from Mount Sinai to Moses. Because, as I told you yesterday, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is pure, the law is holy, the law is righteous, the law is just. There's just this little minor problem, uh, this little minor inconvenience that uh, flesh and blood can't do it. Other than that, we're all fine. Now, if the dispensation of death by letters chiseled in stone came in glory so that the sons of Israel were not able to look intently into the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, which was being nullified, that's the secret here. That glory is being nullified. And yet there are those today, as there were back then, who seek always to resurrect it, to dig up those tablets of stone, to resurrect the Ten Commandments, to bring them back as a viable means to righteousness. This is a way that you can become righteous. But didn't Jesus say, do the commandments? He did. But it was the same as God saying it back at Mount Sinai. A human att attempting it soon realizes his or her worthlessness and turns in desperation to Christ. For even in Israel, the law was an escort to bring people to a reliance on the Messiah who the reason he obeyed the law was because he would fulfill the law for Israel. And now even they are to place their hope in him. We have a much higher message. Paul is comparing it to the law of Moses. But again, this is important, and I'm repeating this from yesterday. But he is skipping the new covenant of Israel entirely. He is. He's skipping it entirely. He's not even alluding to it. He's not even alluding to God fulfilling the the new covenant. Definite article, dark face type, the new covenant with Israel. Because Paul's not talking to Israelites. This is Paul to the Corinthians. They're from Corinth. They're from Greece. They're of the nations. And so they have no business looking into the things of Israel, except Paul is forced to do this because some of them are obsessed with Israelite things. I go on here. 
Moses had a certain glory. There was glory on the face of Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai. But that glory was being nullified. Paul says, how shall not rather, see this is where the comparison comes in, how shall not rather the dispensation of the Spirit be in glory? How much greater is Spirit than stone? That's how much greater this call is to the call of Israel at Mount Sinai. For if the dispensation of condemnation is glory, and again it had a certain glory, much rather, Paul uses that phrase again, the dispensation of righteousness is exceeding in glory. Key word, exceeding. For that also which has been glorified has not been glorified in this particular on account of the glory transcendent. Paul's the only one who uses this word transcendent. It's above and beyond. He calls the grace transcendent and he calls the glory transcendent. This is Paul's way of saying hop, skip, and jump. I said we hop, skip, and jump over Israel. Paul, instead of saying hop, skip, and jump, he uses one word, much more proficient here, much more streamlined, and that is transcendent. It's above and beyond. It skips over the entire New Covenant program with Israel. For Israel, even the Old Covenant is being nullified. For us, who would be tempted to partake in Israel's things, it's more than nullified. It's transcendently nullified. At the same time, it's transcendently glorified. For if that which is being nullified was nullified through glory, much rather that which is remaining remains in glory. I'll end with this. This is good. This is good. Um, wow. Not even the new covenant will be remaining. Not even the new covenant of Israel will be remaining. Paul says that this message of ours is remaining. And we have it now. This is good. Hang on a second. Hang on. In the 1,000 years, listen closely, 1,000 years, a limited period of time, God is going to fulfill what he began with Israel. It's called the new covenant. It's not a covenant at all. It's a figure of speech. But God is going to put the law, the same law of Moses, on their hearts. And the law will go forth from Zion. Micah 4, 2. But that is going to end. As great as the new covenant ends, it's not remaining. As long as... The, as okay, I'm getting excited. As great as the new covenant is, it's not remaining. It only lasts a thousand years. Then what happens to the poor Israelites? They have to transfer to something else. So first they go from the old covenant, laboring under Moses. Then they get the new covenant. Yeah, that's great. Jesus Christ is on the earth. The law is going forth from Zion. We're the priesthood. The nations are bringing their treasures to us. That's fantastic. But what happens after a thousand years is over? They have to learn something new. They have to give up their priesthood. The, the new covenant ends. But what we have now, we never have to transfer. We never have to pack our bags again. We don't have to move again. What Paul is bringing us is remaining. It starts from the very beginning, it remains. From the very beginning, it's, it's Aeonian. It goes not only through Eon 4, but through Eon 5, or all the way up to the consummation. Israel keeps having to pack their bags. They did that even in the wilderness. They kept moving their tents. They watched the glory cloud. They watched the, the fire, a pillar of fire at night, and they moved, moved, moved. Then they went from Moses, then they had to go to um, Jesus Christ, then they go from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, and then what happened? Even the New Covenant gets pulled out from under them at the end of the thousand years. But we don't have to pack our suitcases. We're settled. We're on a foundation that doesn't change. Paul says it's remaining. It remains in glory. It begins in glory, and it remains in glory. Oh, that's good.